So chapter 15 covers uh, alternating current or AC circuit. Uh, as we work with AC circuit, we are continuing to use the linear circuit elements that we finished introducing in chapter 14 and started working with uh, for time dependent circuits in chapter 14. And we also went back to chapter 10 to cover RC circuits, which um, together with the RL circuits is the, the time dependent circuit that shows like an exponential behavior. And we also looked at uh, oscillating LC and RLC circuits as part of chapter 14. So you might ask, or you should ask, what is different in chapter 15? If you are working with the same circuit element and alternating current, it sounds like oscillating circuit. And to that extent, it's uh, quite similar. And in fact, as you look at the resonance in an AC circuit, you will see the connection. Um, the biggest difference would be the driving source uh, or the, the, the what drives the circuit. So when we are working with the time dependent circuit, um, either we were just up or trying to apply a constant voltage or um, or the, somehow the, the configuration of the circuit naturally led to oscillation in the circuit's behavior. That's what we had back in chapter 14. Now in chapter 15, we'll have AC sources. We'll have an alternating current. Even when it's a voltage source, we call it alternating current source. Um, so um, yeah, use a time varying voltage source. Alternating current uh, is the term you use. And, um, and so in an AC circuit, you have a voltage source or a current source that imposes this kind of oscillation. So this oscillation is not something that's uh, naturally arising in the circuit. We have an, an external source that's uh, driving the circuit at a particular frequency or angular frequency here. So that's uh, really the biggest distinction between AC circuits and a time dependent circuit. You are still working with the same circuit elements, register, capacitor, inductor, and um, what we are studying in chapter 15 is, okay, we are going to be applying a voltage at a driving frequency. How does the circuit behave? And when we talk about a driving in the at a frequency, it will always be sinusoidal. Um, and I think I mentioned somewhere about how arbitrary shapes of repeating um, kind of signal can be represented by uh, a a sum of uh, sinusoidal signals. Uh, it, it's a uh, um, it's called a, a Fourier decomposition. So um, so once we understand it's the behavior of the circuit under a sinusoidal driving signal, then we can build up um, its behavior for any other repetitive signal. So um, let's see. Yeah, so this is all the descriptions. <laughs> um, now, one departure you will see in the lecture from the textbook is your textbook will stick strictly to a uh, description of these uh, circuit behaviors using real functions only, or meaning functions that have real number values. Um, and it's at this place where I introduce complex exponentials and use complex exponentials to describe the oscillating voltage, oscillating applied voltage, and also to describe oscillating uh, current, that's the response of the circuit. So, so, so that's the biggest difference you will see between what you see in the textbook and in the lecture. And for the simplest of the circuits, th that distinction won't um, be resulting in a huge difference. Um, so in the lecture also, we go through, an, uh, well, register circuit is a simple circuit, like the time dependence almost doesn't matter because everything is just uh, scaling. Um, it, uh, when you start introducing capacitor, that interesting things happen. And um, I think uh, as an illustration, I do um, show an analysis of an RC circuit using a uh, real, uh, real number value the functions. One challenge you almost immediately start to run into 
is that um, these phase shift get introduced. So, um, so in case of just the capacitor only pure capacity uh, load, then you get phase shifts that are nice in like a 90 degree uh, phase shift or pi over two. It's when you um, it's when you combine in this into more realistic like RC circuit where th those phase shift relationships it gets more um, a little bit complicated and it's a lot simpler to work all this out when you use complex numbers uh, so so in your textbook they will introduce reactants and um, the reactance is kind of something that to uh, uh, in conceptual sense, uh, similar to resistance, uh, you know, you take the ratio of the voltage to current, and you get reactance. It fulfills really similar roles as resistance. Now, in order to describe the reactance, you have to describe this phase shift that occurs. And the way your textbook will describe this phase shift is you, with the use of a, a diagram called a phasor diagram. This is the phasor diagram that can be used to describe, okay, so if this is the voltage that we are applying, then our current is not perfectly in sync with the voltage as it was the case for register. So, um, so we can imagine describing this voltage as the X component of this arrow that's going in a circle at an angular frequency of omega. And um, someone, someone figured out we can uh, kind of fit the response of the current into this uh, description if we imagine current as another vector that's uh, pointing in a different direction. Uh, imagine these two vectors both rotating at angular frequency omega. And to obtain the quantities that you actually measure in lab with the circuits, because you are not measuring arrows, you take the x component. So that's where you get a v naught cosine of omega t as it rotates through. And your current, if we started out pointing here, then it would be um, uh, the the x component of the current that you measure would look like i naught sine of omega t, or sorry, i naught minus sine of omega t. So, so this phasor diagram is how your textbook describes this relationship. And as you look at the lecture, where the treatment is a little bit different, what I do encourage you to look at is there's a one-to-one -one relationship between this phasor diagram and the representation of complex numbers on a complex plane. You can think of the y-axis as the imaginary axis and the x-axis as the real axis. Um, and um, so, so yeah, that uh, so that's a for capacitor. When your textbook goes through all this and uh, works out the similar relationship for inductor, and when you go through the calculus and do all that. By the way, calculus is a lot easier when you use complex exponentials. And, and in any case, when you do all that, um, in terms of the magnitude, this is what you get. But uh, you will see in the phasor diagram that there are some properties of reactance of inductor that's quite different from capacitor. So for capacitor, the current, the phasor for the current, to, for capacitor, it was pointing this way. For the inductor, it points in the opposite direction. And um, and when you add these things on a phasor diagram, the reactance of the capacitor can be canceled out by the reactance of the inductor. And all this relationship is nicely captured when we describe their complex impedance, which again is only possible when you're dealing with the complex exponentials. So, so your textbook will go through all this description without introducing complex exponentials because that's the standard way to cover this. And that approach will necessarily limit your textbook to ending the analysis here, um, RLC series circuits. That's uh, as far as your textbook can go. It has to do with how you add reactances. So, um, so you know, reactances again, they fulfill the similar role as registers. 
And as you look at the role of React tensor, so you want to add them. And registers in series are very easy to add. You just add <laughs> the normal way. And when you have faders on a fader diagram, um, these arrows, they are really easy to add. Uh, if you think of them like vectors, so you just simply add them together, that gives you the overall total impedance as a phasor expression, and and you relate that um, relate the applied voltage to the the current response through that um, through that total uh, impedance that you can get by adding the phasors on a phasor diagram. Now, this is my challenge to you. <laughs> um, how would you do similar analysis if you are dealing with either RLC parallel circuit or maybe an RLC circuit where some of them are parallel? Maybe the inductor and the capacitor are parallel, but registers in series with that uh, two parallel elements. And um, I, I think we do some work. It's possible to figure all that out, but I will give you the short answer, which is that it's going to be very complicated. And, and that's why your textbook doesn't do it. Your textbook ends with the RLC series of circuit because that's the natural limitation of how far you can go using just the phasor diagram expression. So you know, when people are actually working with AC circuits and analyzing more complicated looking circuits, uh, they use complex impedance because when you use complex impedance, when you have these elements in parallel, you can add them like registers in parallel. You take the reciprocal, add the reciprocals, take the reciprocal again, that gives you the total impedance. Now, you know, <laughs> imagine taking a reciprocal of phasors like this, and with some effort, you can come up with a correct procedure, but it's um, uh, conceptually a lot harder than just taking a complex number and taking the reciprocal. So, so, so your textbook's coverage will necessarily end here, but the approaches we introduce in lecture can go farther than RLC series circuits. So um, for the remainder of the chapter 15, so they talk about a power in AC circuit. I also talk about the same thing. And I guess uh, the, um, uh, the key punchline, summary, important point, is summarized at the very end, which is that uh, power dissipated in any circuit uh, will have this uh, uh, expression that average power is the RMS uh, current, some sense of average current squared times R, just the resistance, not the reactances of capacitors or, um, or the inductors. Those reactances of capacitors and inductors, they do affect the circuit. They do affect how much current flows. They do kind of resist how much current can flow through the circuit. But capacitors and inductors, they don't on net uh, expand energy. They don't dissipate any energy. So any power that's dissipated in an AC circuit is dissipated through a register, not capacitor or inductor. And um, there's a, and there's a, um, numerical parameter that's used to uh, describe sort of what portion of the thing that's affecting the circuit is resistive and what portion is uh, reactive. I don't know if that's the right uh, adjective. Um, and that's called the power factor. This uh, power factor is in, uh, useful in characterizing uh, behavior of the circuit. And I think I have a separate lecture dealing with power in an AC circuit that I've done uh, last year. So take a look at that. Uh, again, <laughs> I'm going to be using uh, uh, complex exponentials. And I, I think I, with the power, uh, fact, the power dissipation in AC circuit, I also introduced some mathematical operations that you do have to be careful when you're using complex exponentials. Um, it, yeah, it has to do with when you're multiplying two complex numbers, you have to be careful. Otherwise, some of the conventions will be used in using complex exponentials breakdown. So you have to be careful. And finally, the resonance in an AC circuit is where you see the kind of the natural connection between the oscillating circuit you've seen in the last chapter and, and resonance. So resonance can be viewed as, you know, you have a circuit that's a frequency dependent. And there's some special frequency where something special happens. Either the most amount of current flows 
or if you change around the arrangement, you can make it so that the least amount of current flows. In any case, there's some special frequency and the value for that special frequency turns out to be the, the oscillating frequency for an LC circuit. And um, it's a, there's a really good uh, analogy between these oscillating circuits and uh, mechanical systems. So if you imagine a, either pendulum or mass on a spring, there's a natural oscillation frequency. And when you are um, uh, driving those systems, like imagine someone who's uh, on a swing and you're pushing them. And if you want the swing to be get swing to get larger and larger with a small amount of push you have to push them at the right frequency on the resonance frequency and uh, this is the circuit version of that so um, talks about the resonance frequency and uh, i guess no phase shift yeah so you know we are really touching only briefly on ac circuits uh, so for those of you who might not be majoring in electrical engineering or uh, physics, um, it's possible that you will never see circuits and you never have to worry about this, which is fine. Um, and for those of you who are engineer, uh, majoring in electrical engineering or physics, you will see more circuits. And this is a little taste of what you might see either in upper division or your engineering circuits lab. So, and finally, the transformers, this is where your textbook covers it. We covered this along with uh, inductance. Uh, well, along with the mutual inductance, where I thought the relationship was the most uh, cleanest. But your textbook has transformer thing here. You can read about it here.